Transmitting high atop of Florida's peninsula at 108 feet. This is Alpha Mike, and you are listening to episode 199. The 1% MC clubs, the big five. Why we have changed course in Wise Guy series from the Mafia or La Costa Nostra to outlaw motorcycle clubs. The government calls them criminal organizations. They say, not so fast. We've got criminals in the organization, but the organization is not criminal. The government says, baloney. So we're going to spell out the big five, who they are, and you're going to be the judge during this series that we do in 2021 are they criminal groups like the mafia or do they have criminals in the group you be the judge how do you get in contact with us it's easy RaiderCop.com takes you to the website where you can hear all our web broadcast or, or episodes from one to 199 that's a whole lot of episodes and we encourage you to listen also you can go to RaiderCopNation.com that's our official website where you can get more information on us upcoming shows and of course past shows as well we are on social media all you gotta do is look us up by plugging in on your browser whatever social media you're looking for, and then hit Raider Cop or Raider Cop Podcast. We most likely will appear. Don't look for us on Twitter. We're long gone from that heathen place, and you won't find us there. The spotlight that we have today for our social media is Parlor, where you can find us at, under at Raider Cop and Parlor is back. We encourage you to get on board. I know it's a little difficult with the, uh, I'm not sure, sure about Android, but I know Apple is still acting like a communist influencer, and they don't allow you to download the app or whatever because it's not within the Bolshevik rules and regulations. But um, I deleted mine Um erroneously but I did because as I was trying to get back on my parlor account Raider Cop we were we there was a, a, a notice delete your your app to reinstall it's exactly what we did and then the okie dokie was played on us because when we try to bring it back or upload it again, we were told the joke's on you. You're not going to be allowed to have that on an Apple product. But you can't get it from your browser. We do have it, and that's how we use it. Not as much as we would if we had access to the cell phone, but, you know, when with the Bolsheviks, do as the Bolsheviks do. So we're going to have to do it off the desktop. Rate a cop on Parlor. We encourage you to meet us there. This episode 199, why do we do it? The Wise Guy series is one of the biggest episodes that we do on Rate a Cop. A lot of uh, people are into criminal element, true crime, mafia. That bad boy type of uh, personalities, they like them. They download it and they hear them a whole, whole lot. 
Um, I believe when we, early on, we did an episode on the Bonanno crime family. And that one episode, uh, when we launched it, it had like 680 downloads like in the same day, which um, we weren't very big back then. But there is a hunger for this stuff by Americans and everybody around the world. Why? I can't explain that. But I can tell you this. If you're fascinated about crime and true crime and mafia and that criminal element, I can tell you how each person that you hear about or you study, how it's going to end. It will end with death or prison. They all do. Now, this episode 199 and how we start shifting from La Costa Nostra Mafia in America for a short little break. We're going to start looking at these outlaw motorcycle clubs that call themselves one percenters. We'll explain that in a minute. But the question that the audience has to answer as they listen to not only this episode, but the other five that are coming. So it'll be about a total of six. And then you be the judge. The United States government calls them a criminal enterprise masquerading as a motorcycle club. And the motorcycle clubs themselves say, no, no, not so fast. We are a club and they are criminals in the club and we are not constrained by any rules, regulations, or law to know someone's background. So we're going to dive into that into this episode and five more where you will be the judge. I can tell you one thing. I wouldn't be so fast in just saying, no, no, a bunch of dirt bikes, uh, dirt bags, and they're on motorcycle bikes, and, and they're just no good. Don't be so fast pointing the finger. Because organized crime, which is really supposedly secret, a lot of those secrets are not very strong or profound because the government knows about it and so does the media. A lot of who's who. There are some slight mysteries in the mafia. But here we have to ask a general question. If there's thousands, we'll leave that open-ended for now, of members in a specific club or all of them working as a unit under the umbrella of the club? This is a fascinating question and one that really needs to be looked at. I, I believe that the government does an extraordinary job in polluting the minds of Americans that may serve on a jury one day by basically smearing with one brush that anyone that is a part of these groups is a criminal. But you're going to be fascinated to know some of the people that have been are affiliated to these clubs. And they're not criminals. So what's the real story? So an interesting topic. Before we get to that, we're going to read the Word of God because we know that without the Word of God, we have nothing. So, we're not going to hold you up any further. So, let's get this party started. From the book of 2 Corinthians 7.10, the Word says, For godly Sorrows produce repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrows of the world produces death. 
2 Corinthians 7.10. You can hear more about this um, on our series, A Wall Mondays. And um, there'll be probably less than 30 minutes. And it goes much more into detail of what I've read, what it means. And it's for your own spiritual growth. We know that the Word of God, even when you hear it and you're a non-believer, the seed is planted. Whether that gives fruit or not lies with you and with God. Today's episode that we will look at is episode 199, the 1% MC Club Big Five. Who are the Big Five? Up next. Episode 199, the 1% MC Clubs, the Big Five. We have to ask ourselves the first question and the most important question. What in the world do they mean by 1%? Well, back in the early 40s or mid-40s, in Hollister, California, the American Motorcycles Association knowing that there were kind of like a couple of troublemakers back in 1947, 48, let's say. Uh, Riff Raffs, you know, like uh, the, the movie with Marlon Brando, riding motorcycles and causing trouble. And the American Motorcycles Association didn't really like that label. So they publicly started making the announcement that 99% of people that ride motorcycles are law-abiding citizens, but there is that 1%, you know, the smelly ones. Well, that's who we're talking about today, the 1%. Today, you really have to ask yourself the question, are they still 1% or is that number grown? Regardless of the fact, the outlaws have taken that 1% claim, made a patch out of it. It's called a diamond. And if you're not a diamond club member or an outlaw, I wouldn't be putting one on if you don't want to have any trouble. Because that 1% diamond patch is a world amongst their own in outlaw motorcycle clubs. So the one percenter is born. It gives birth. Outside the rules, live by their own rules and regulations, don't like authority, mostly were born out of the Second World War. And, of course, many more followed after Korea and Vietnam as well. So they're the highly trained, love patriotic American that believes in America at one time in their life, does their service for the country, and when they come back, they feel that they've been disgraced, not honored, spit upon. They become the outlaw one percenters, and today they don't like to live by society's rules. Some of them have difficulty finding jobs. Some of them are very successful business people. Some of them might even be involved in criminal enterprises. But some 
may just be regular family guys with wives, with a wife, kid. That's it. Nothing more to report. So we're going to take a dive and we're going to look more into the outlaw one percenters. So what do they all have in common? Well, I'm going to kind of spell it out the MO, modus operandi, real quick. Under law enforcement terms, they wear jackets. They call them cuts or colors. Their name of the group is on that jacket. The logo of the group is on there. And on the bottom rocker, the bottom part of the jacket, they will give a distinction of locale. What area do they come from? Most of the time, it will have a location in this country regarding a state. Uh, California, New York, Florida, uh, Texas, and so forth. They also believe in riding American motorcycles and Harleys at that. They don't believe in the little racing bikes or none of that. Definitely they don't believe in foreign motorcycles, but American-made. That goes to show you that they have been patriots, always. The infamous and famous Hell's Angel, Sonny Barger, once said in an interview, we incorporated the American motorcycle because we believe in America. But the Harley is a motorcycle that he just doesn't really like. But they ride it because it's American. That tells you a lot. They also have in common, I would say, behavior. When I say behavior, I'm talking about uh, don't follow the rules. You're not going to tell me what to do. Um, I kind of rule this town wherever I'm at. And I have that bad boy personality. They all have that. They also have the common culture of clubhouse mentalities that they're not friends in the club but brothers in a club they all have the same type of modus operandi when it comes to women that women are just below the family dog. That's what they say. Don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you their culture. They, as I said, some have difficulty with society, so they have had difficulty having jobs, continuing careers, and some have been successful in careers. The one percenters have also penetrated areas such as Hollywood, where famous actors and singers have kind of gathered around one percenters. It's they feel good being near them and associated to them. As a result, the one percenters being that bad boy attitude have been glamorized by the media as well. At that same time they're glamorized, sometimes the media will make them villains because that's what the government does as well. So what also do they have in common? Well, one of the other things that they have in common is that the United States government has labeled them one percenters or as criminal groups that deal in murder, guns, and drugs, period, nothing else to discuss. Broad brush for thousands of people. 
as I said earlier, you as the audience, you need to be the judge whether this is true or not true. Remember, when we brush with that broad brush, every individual in every group that I talk about has to fit the mold that the government says they fit. A criminal enterprise and a member of that enterprise. He can't be half-stepping. They either are or they aren't. And that's the question that we have to ask. So who are the big five? Now, the United States government, Department of Justice, labels them as the big four. We've taken the liberty here on Radar Cop Podcast to throw in one more. We'll explain it as we go through this these series of uh, six episodes on this, that this last group that we're placing in, and I'm going to go through the groups in a second, we're placing them in because they're taking a bigger role. So let's start off first. Based on, and I'm going to take a kind of guess, I don't have it in front of me, in front of me so don't hold me to the fire. But we're going to start off with the Outlaws, incorporated 1934-35 in Illinois. They are the oldest of the Outlaw groups. The name itself tells you a lot about them. There's where the media comes up with the term Outlaws. They have... Although the distinction of being the oldest, they're not probably the most sophisticated. As far as size, there's a question of all their sizes, but there is no real big, big club that morphs the other ones. So, number one, outlaw group that we'll be looking at are the outlaws. The second group is probably the most famous in American society because, as I said earlier, the American Hollywood elite movie stars and singers have gravitated to them, and that's the Hells Angels formulated in 1948 out of California, they have grown into a large group, pushing their way through the geographical area of the United States and Europe and other continents, quite frankly. Known as the most sophisticated of the groups. We don't really know if that's true because, remember, if you're not a one percenter, you really shouldn't know anything about the group. But we can tell you that there have been books written about this group, the Hells Angels, and a lot of experts have said they are the most sophisticated as far as They're leading the way, or they have led the way for a lot of these outlaw groups or 1% groups. It's kind of like, let's follow what they do. But it's not carved in stone. And of course, we are talking about the big five, so the other four will probably get offended based on what I just said uh, regarding the Hells Angels. The next group will probably be the Pagans, and I believe their start date is uh, 1966. Might be wrong, 67, 66. Maryland, and then they got into the region of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and so forth. Today, they claim the eastern sector of the United States. This group, the Pagans, have... uh, even remove the bottom rocker which would illustrate on their jacket what state they're from 
You see the pagans all say they're from the east coast of the United States and they've actually put down us on their jackets, east coast. So you don't really know where they're located. Now this could be a good thing and this could also be a bad thing. We'll discuss that as we go through this series as far as a law enforcement point of view and prosecutions as the United States government tries to pin things, pain, pin things on people. Got tongue-tied there for a second. Our next group would, of course, be the Bandidos. I believe they started in 1970. <clears throat> I could be wrong. Again, don't have it in front of me. But I'm kind of late 60s, early 70s. <clears throat> and mostly from the area of Texas or the central region of the United States. There's a lot of issues about how their colors, yellow and red, were formulated. Their founder was in the Marine Corps, so the rumor is there's where they got the colors. Some say no. It, uh, their logo is of a bandito Mexican, and that comes from the potato chips uh, and the Frito Burrito, or whatever it was called, and there's where that name comes from. We don't really know, but that's what they call themselves, the Banditos. And uh, probably, I'll, I'll even take a risk here, that they may be the largest of the one percenters. So, not really 100% sure, because remember, they're supposed to be a secret society. So the 99 should know what the 1% is doing. I'm just saying. And lastly, we here at Raider Cop Podcast, we have thrown in the Mongols. 1969 was their original, original date of birth. And mostly out of Southern California, they got into a little bit of a ruckus with the Hells Angels and probably in the late, uh, in the uh, excuse me, in the early 70s, over the bottom rocker, because you see the Mongols in California, they wanted to wear California on the bottom, and the Hells Angels said that's not acceptable, and there was a disagreement. There have also been former members of the Hells Angels that had executive positions. I said, that's a bunch of baloney. That's not true. That never happened. The war with the Mongols was over a girl. But we wouldn't know, would we? Because we're the 99%, and we should not know what the 1% is doing. We picked the Mongols primarily because they have been on the move and growing within the United States. Well, you might say, well, then what's the big deal? There's a lot of 1% crews or clubs that are growing within the United States. What makes the Mongols so special? Well, one important element would be that the United States government did a barrage attack on them about 10 years ago. It was supposed to take the Mongols out. In fact, the government, the Justice Department, even tried to take their trademark logo jacket emblems, cuts, colors from them. At one point, forbidding them to wear them. But they won their trademark back. A little bit of an overreach from the government. But the government gave it its all and still failed. And they shouldn't be growing, but they are. So we've added them to 
the big list. Government calls it the big four. We're calling it the big five. Now, there are probably a whole lot other 1% clubs I know. No need to get nasty. There are a bunch of them out there. And we're not really looking at them within these six episodes that we're doing. We're just doing the five. We will at one point get down to the others. They all have a common trait. They all have a common personality. They all have a common culture. And they all have common rules that they live by and die by. Does that make them criminal enterprises? Or are they criminals in their interest? You're going to be the judge to that. So we broke down the five groups that we're looking at. Now the question that I've already posed to you is, are they a criminal group, period, like the government says? In other words, if you see, let's say, five of them riding their motorcycles down a specific street in Main Street, USA. And they're whatever club you want them to be. But they're one percent. When you look at them, and you say, yep, there's no doubt all five are thugs, criminals, beyond a reasonable doubt. Oh, can you say, I have no idea? Why does the government go out of their way and out of their reach to constantly, constantly tell Americans via the media that anybody that's a 1% club are criminals? During the Mongol case over 10 years ago, when the government tried to take their cuts, colors, logos, emblems, whatever you want to call it, and try to charge them with RICO, we've done episodes here on RICO in the past, it didn't work. It kind of failed. When the government tried to do a RICO case, the first Rico case. We've done an episode on that too against the Hells Angels in 1979. It blew up in the government's face. Government was preaching that the Hells Angels was a criminal organization dealing in drugs and other criminal elements. Period. But the Hells Angels lawyers said, no, 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 wait, hold on. Stop. Let's stop right there. We are a group. We wear jackets. We self-identify as this group, one percenters. But we're not all criminals. There are some that are criminals, but not all of us. And they won. That was in 1979. The government was so crippled by that one case that they didn't emerge again in a full-fledged attack against another criminal organization until they faced the American Mafia, La Costa Nostra, in the commission case, 1985, because they were disgustingly pimp-slapped by the Hells Angels attorneys in 1979. They did not know, the government did not know how to use the RICO statutes, especially against one percenters. Today, I can assure you that the government still has difficulty understanding how to apply RICO to this group. They apply it very well to the American Mafia, which is also supposed to be a secret organization, and they don't self-identify by wearing color cuts on their suits, you know, Lucchese and 
I'm a Genovese and I'm a Gambino guy. It's supposed to be a secret society. You know, nobody's supposed to know. So the government's done very well on that side of the street. But against the one percenters, they kind of hit or miss. Hmm. Now, the last question we're going to ask ourselves is the government's point of view. Is it right? Is it correct? If I were to say every blah, blah, blah group is a criminal enterprise, that'd be prejudicial. These are really important words that I'm using today. If I said anybody that comes out of this region, they are blah, blah, blah. Would that be prejudicial? If I put all my eggs in a basket, do you know which ones might be hard-boiled? Or do they all look like eggs? Difficult question. But according to the government, 1% groups work in tandem to move large amounts of methamphetamine, other drugs, guns, and sometimes they're even hired for murder. Big stuff they're talking about. Since the syndicate in this country, 1929, you don't really hear much about syndicate operations. You hear about the mafia. We label them. They're Italians. The Italians. But you don't really have... Who are these syndicate people? They'd be the one percenters now. I don't know. But just like nobody really knew who the syndicate was... You see, the government, they're experts at labeling people. If I can't label you, I can't sell you. So I've got to label you, put your barcode on you so you can get scanned at the checkout counter, and everybody knows how much you're worth. That's what the government does. So you might say, well, you kind of like leaning on that they're not coming along this not be too fast. I'm not putting all five eggs in one carton and saying none of them are hard-boiled. Remember, you're the jury, not me. That is what we are looking at on these episodes that we're going to be uh, doing on One Percenters, and it's to educate you. Now, I'm not, not an expert on outlaw, 1% clubs, and so forth. And I do listen quite often to a couple of uh, podcasters or YouTubers that educate people on that society. And it is quite fascinating, uh, their culture and how they operate within American society. But they're not against, let's just say, the country. They might be against the Justice Department. They might be against uh, the FBI, ATF, DEA, whatever, you know, agencies investigating them. But they're not necessarily against the country. A lot of them have served in the military. They did so proudly. So, they're not an organization that despises America. A lot of them stand proud of being American. This is a difficult group to label. As we explore more in our series of the One Percenters, we'll talk about some that are distinguished, that are or aren't any longer in these clubs. But while they were there, they were labeled. But why are they so successful today? 
because if you're a criminal, you're always a criminal, right? You can't, nobody can ever change. That's the headlines. Sometimes I wonder about the United States government and how good they are to villainize countries, people, places, things. They're pretty good at it. The talking heads come up at that point and everybody just repeats it like a parrot and the media picks it up and like our good old commie friends used to say or our good Nazi friends used to say too, if you repeat something long enough, it becomes the truth. So you have to wonder sometimes in the government's position. Beyond a reasonable doubt that somebody is what you're accusing them to be, that's a very high standard that the founding fathers of our country have placed. Do I just take some feces and throw it on the wall and say that all of it's stuck to the wall? Or do I watch it just bounce off and some of it dribble out off the wall? So we have a lot of interesting points that we're going to talk about the outlaw motorcycle groups and um, some interesting stuff that the government uh, has said about them during the years and some interesting points where the government is currently thinking about going towards them. Recently, I posted on one of these uh, outlaw groups YouTube channel that from my point of view, law enforcement point of view, each case that they present against one of these clubs should be harder than the last one. Not easier. You see, since that defeat in 1979, the government has never recovered from that one-two punch. Yeah, they fake it when the bell rings and they come back out. But they're still staggering. They haven't really put it together. That's a problem. A lot of people might say, and I'll finish with this, that there are tremendous amounts of people cooperating within these clubs, especially these new founded 1% clubs that may be 5, 10, 15 years old. There are no comparison to the originals that I just discussed. Well, that's not necessarily the truth. Just because your club is, how old are you, your club? 10 years? Oh, you guys ain't real. That's not the way that's supposed to work. The real thing is RICO. RICO, the government has learned how to grab people individually and say, we're going to put you away for 50 years if you don't start chirping. And the 1% culture has become victims to this, no different from the American mafia. If you can walk, you'll walk. And you'll burn like the mafia calls your friends and like the 1%ers call my brothers. But you'll you'll step all over them not to do 50 years. Thanks to Rico. Up next, the have and have nots in law enforcement. A distinct culture. What in the world is the have and have nots? Well, there's people in the agency that can get away with murder. And there's people in the agency they can't get away with anything. Episode 200. That's up next. The have and have not. As always, it has been my honor and pleasure to be your host on Radio Cop Podcast. Continue to pray for yourself because without you in the game, we have nothing. Continue to pray for your family, your community, the law enforcement agencies that serve you. And most importantly, continue to pray for the United States. States of America. This is Alpha Mike, and I'm out.